Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Knudsen, for those I don't know. Uh, we're talking from SUNY Upstate, and this is our first edition of EMS Medicine Live. So, amongst a lot of EMS physicians, both at uh, NESP and in the Upstate area, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about an online conference to kind of bring together community and academic physicians and other EMS resources uh, for ongoing education. Um, we've been talking about this for a couple of years, and uh, we finally brought this together to bring folks together online to do it. Uh, we do hope in our future we have group involvement from as many people as possible. Um, at least from uh, our standpoint, we want to at least meet uh, EMS physicians and fellows at different facilities uh, and either the next coming months, hoping that other folks provide content uh, for these uh, conferences. Uh, we all know that you all have unique experiences and skills and opportunities at different locations, uh, and we hope that uh, folks can bring those to the table for presentations in the future. Uh, we do have three course directors, um, at least at the top of my screen, you can see them. Uh, there's Brian Clemency from SUNY Buffalo. He's Buffalo trained in med school, residency and fellowship, I believe, and he's their EMS fellowship program director. Say hi, Brian. He's not listening. Okay. Uh, there's Derek. Derek. Too slow on my mic button. Ah, uh, gotcha. Uh, there's Derek Coney, who's joining us from the ER, uh, so he'll be in and out. Uh, he's from Texas. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, joined Upstate about six, seven years ago, uh, and he's currently the EMS Fellowship Program Director. And then there's me, uh, been at SUNY Upstate for about five years, uh, trained in Pittsburgh, I'm um, the Fellowship Associate Director. We are going to use Zoom uh, for this conference and hopefully conferences in the future. Um, I think everyone's muted right now. We'll keep everyone muted during the presentation. Uh, I think this can turn into a free-for-all knowing EMS doctors a little too easily. Uh, if you do have a specific question you want answered at the end, uh, chat me um, during this. I'll kind of keep track of questions. We can try to ca either call on people or I'll just read the questions at the end for, to be answered. Uh, I am recording this conference. Um, you can also record on your end if you want. I believe that's an option. Uh, but at the very least, we'll record it. And we hope to post it uh, either on our EMS fellowship site or an individual site in the near future. Uh, questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to unmute everyone. We'll see how that works. Um, and then kind of call on folks for questions and see how it goes. I'm sure there may be some technical problems. There always are. Um, this is a new system to us uh, and hopefully it'll work well. If you have any problems or suggestions for improvement, you can chat message me or email me in the future. Um, to make it work better. So today uh, we have Erin Wirths. Uh, she is our uh, current EMS fellow. Uh, she trained at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia and has been with us for about just over six months and has been a fantastic EMS fellow uh, doing air medical, tactical, uh, ground and other activities. Uh, fire too, sorry Tom. Uh, also doing fire. Um, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, field amputations. So let's see if this works. Aaron? Hello. Uh, one thing, Aaron has no video um, due to a technical problem, uh, but you'll be able to hear her quite well. So when I was approached to do this first lecture, I was asked what topic I wanted to do, and one of my favorite topics, and a topic that is getting a lot of talk right now is prolonged extrication and field amputations. So we decided to take a look at some of the research that's out there and some of the data and just put together a basic presentation for the first um, series here to try to invoke some conversation and see how well we could do with trying to get everybody together and get our opinions all in one place. So, just to get started, one second. There we go. So just some basic definitions so everyone's on the same page. The definition of an extrication, we all know this, but it's removal from entrapment or a dangerous situation or position. When we talk about entrapment in the lecture, it's to be caught within a closed area with no way out. And when we talk about field or pre-hospital amputation, we're talking about the removal of a body part to aid in extrication in an attempt to save a life. 
There's another definition that I didn't put up here that I wanted to mention just because I talked about it a little bit in the end, and that's uh, dismemberment, which is removal of a body part in the dis already deceased to help aid in the extrication in an attempt to save a life that may be entrapped beyond that um, deceased person. So when we talk about extrication, we talk about the 10 spaces of extrication, you know, you have preparation, which is kind of exactly what we're doing right now, we're doing training on the reasons why you would do an amputation, doing training on how you would do it, and just being prepared for the situation should it arise. And then when that situation arises, you know, the first thing is you're en route to the scene. This causes some, some issues with, you know, safe driving and weather conditions, especially up here in upstate New York. We've had some serious snow and ice lately that's caused some issues getting to scenes. Um, once you get to the scene and you hopefully get there safely, you then have arrival and uh, scene size up. This is important, you know, to look for any um, outside hazards and then do the next step, which is hazard control. So that's, you know, we use a lot of outside um, agencies to help us with hazard control. We use law enforcement for maybe crowd control, traffic control. We have fire on scene for any hazmat situations. Um, you know, we have other hazards such as maybe down power lines from an MVC. Is there a structural collapse? Is there um, anything else that we need to worry about when we get up on scene? And that also comes into play with the support operations, which is the next phase. And support operations would be things like, you know, the tools, the lighting, the um, scene setup that you may need to be able to perform your duties of extrication. Then starts the active process, which is gaining access to the patient. It's kind of common sense, exactly what it says it is, trying to gain access to where the patient is and try to do the patient extrication. Then after you gain access, providing emergency care on scene. Um, this is where you know the, the basic emergency care comes in, you know, our ABCs and giving the patient any care we can while they're still being extricated from the, the scene that they're in. The disentanglement stage, this comes, you know, where the rescue team has their power tools, they're trying to get them out, and this is also where the actual um, field amputation would, would come into play, whether or not you need to amputate a body part in order to be able to safely and effectively remove that patient from the, extra, um, from the entanglement. Once you're able to disentangle the patient, you have removal and transfer from the scene. In this, you know, we need to make sure, do we have the appropriate resources? Do we have the proper ambulance? Are we going to the proper facility? Do we have the proper facility that would be able to take care of this patient after we get them off the scene? And then termination, which hopefully is not termination of your patient, but instead termination of your duties on the scene. So what are some potential entrapment scenarios that would require a field amputation? Well, we have the big ones, you know, the building collapses, the other structural collapses, there's been bridge collapses, uh, train derailments, any industrial, mining, farming accidents can be a big one with a lot of the machinery that they have, uh, heavy equipment failure, you know, these are the um, people are getting stuck in the augers and the grinders and, and things like that. And then the most uh, basic ones that we're seeing are the motor vehicle collisions, which are becoming more and more uh, prevalent, it seems. I did want to say just a little bit on the history of field amputation. Um, a lot of the data that we are using and a lot of the data that potentially can be used and extrapolated into civilian use all comes from the military, just like most things in, in trauma. Um, the Civil War field amputations was actually the most commonly performed procedure in the war medically. And then you go kind of all the way through the wars. I'm not going to go through each war and the advancements in each one, but obviously in OIF and OEF, we're still doing a lot of field amputations, but actually much less due to the fact that we have other medical means to be able to treat these people. Because some of these field amputations in the, or most of these field amputations in the beginning were due to infection, not so much the entanglement and entrapment that we're talking about now. Um, more of the field amputations that you see now are due to the entanglement and entrapment and less due to the um, infectious process because we have so many advancements in antibiotics and, and field care. Uh, there have been some major disasters, you know, recently that we've been able to learn a lot about field amputations. You had the Skywatch Bridge collapse at the Hyatt Regency in Kansas City back in 81, uh, San Francisco earthquake in 89, there was the earthquake in India in 2001, Pakistan in 2005, and then the, the big one that we're getting a lot of recent data from is obviously the Haiti earthquake in 2010. Um, there was a lot of structural collapse there and a lot of um, need for both amputation for disentanglement, but also amputation um, for, you know, basic life-saving and, and infectious processes. And then another thing that I just wanted to touch on was sort of this evolution that we're seeing of field amputations um, predominantly being done by strictly by trauma surgeons in the field 
to now we're seeing a big shift towards, you know, us as EMS physicians being the people who are being called upon to do these. And then also, um, you know, there's a case of a, a paramedic and uh, then the whole discussion of whether or not this should be a paramedic um, level skill under the direct supervision or indirect supervision of an EMS physician. So there are some people who strictly believe that this still should just be a trauma surgeon or orthopedic surgeon procedure. Obviously, most people listening to this talk, myself included, don't feel that way. Um, we feel as though this is an EMS physician procedure. And then, you know, I'm sure even the people that are just tuned in here now have very differing opinions on whether or not this should be a uh, paramedic level procedure. So when do we amputate? That's kind of the, the fire question in all of this. You know, you don't just show up to a scene because someone's trapped. You just automatically go to amputating their limb. That would give us all a bad name and it's probably not the best thing to do for your patient. So in 2010, we had the paper from Porter um, entitled Pre-Hospital Amputation. This was in the um, Journal of Emergency Medicine. And the three bullets that they put out was that an amputation in the field is indicated when uh, you have scene characteristics provide immediate threats to the patient or the rescuers. A uh, person's clinical indication is such that the person will die with further delay and that the limb remains minimally attached. To me, there is some ambiguity in that. You know, what is minimally attached? What What is the clinical indication? Um, at what point do you say that they will die without further delay? And then also, I did like the fact that they put in that there were immediate threats to both the patient or the rescuers. I think that that's a big point to take into consideration when you're looking at these different scenes and looking at you know whether or not you need to amputate is not just the patient's safety and getting the patient out and saving the patient's life, but you want to make sure that the scene is not deteriorating and becoming unsafe for the rescuers and that an amputation would help um, make the scene more safe for those trying to rescue uh, your, the, the patients. Uh, in 2012, this is a newer paper, I don't know if everybody's read or not, but McIntyre et al., um, Extreme Measures, Field Amputation on the Living and Dismemberment of the Deceased to Extricate Individuals in Trapped and Collapsed Structures. This was in Disaster Medicine and Public Health Preparedness. And they just kind of it, it went along the same lines as the Porter paper, but it was a little bit uh, different in saying that the person's clinical condition is such that any delay in extrication could cause loss of that individual's life. So that just seemed like a, a subtle way of changing it, saying that any delay in extrication could cause a loss to that individual's life, not that they were kind of on the um, on the, the verge of, of losing their life. The environment poses such a high level risk to person and rescuer, again, they included rescuer, such that it cannot be ameliorated and is immediately life-threatening. And the individual's degree of entanglement or entrapment is such that extrication is not possible without amputation. Now, that also led to some discussion um, saying that at what point are you able to say and who is the person who should have the authority to be able to say that extrication is not possible without amputation? You know, is this a uh, physician thought? Is this something that you obviously would want to make in conjunction with the people who are doing the technical rescue? Is this, you know, a joint conversation that should be had and should who should be in on that conversation? But these points in the McIntyre paper do mirror the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group um, criteria that was put out. They put out a pretty detailed um, list of all the um, criteria to amputate in the field. So what can we use uh, for more objective data to be able to determine when we go up on a scene of whether or not this is someone who needs an amputation? We do have different scoring systems. Um, that are out there. The one that I was most familiar with is the MESS, the Mangled Extremity Severity Score. But I did find these other ones, the LSI, which is the Limb Salvage Index, PSI, Predictive Salvage Index, the NISSSA, and the Hanover Fracture Scale. The only problem with these scoring systems is that these are mainly applied to more sterile conditions. You know, you have a patient who's already in the hospital and the, the surgeons are determining whether or not their already injured limb is uh, salvageable or not, or whether they would benefit better from amputation. So some of these can get pretty complex. I think that if we're going to um, use one, and this is a point of discussion at the end, that the least involved and the easiest to apply to pre-hospital is the, the MESS, the Mangled Extremity Severity Score. For that, if you have a score greater than or equal to 7, it's 100% predictive of amputation. So just to go through some of them. Sorry, I'm just having a hard time advancing the slides. Um, the mess. So you have different um, areas that you look at to try to get a score. The first one is what type of um, energy 
was uh, involved in the actual entanglement. So, you know, if you have a low injury, they get one low energy injury, they get one point. If you have a medium up all the way up through massive crush, then you then look at their vital signs. So there's the shock group, normal tensive, hypotensive, prolonged hypertension. Um, how much ischemia is involved in the limb, and then they have a, a category for the age group. Now, looking over this, you know, one thing that I found is if you roll up on a scene, you have a very stable patient, vitals-wise, their blood pressure is completely normal, but you have someone who is involved in a massive crush and has a pulseless, cool, paralyzed, um, numb limb without any cap refill, right there, they're already at an eight, so they're above the, the, the seven that it's saying, you know, 100% predictive of amputation. So. That kind of goes against the prior slides that say that you know when you should amputate would be when you have a patient who is becoming unstable and this is to um, prevent uh, life threats. Just to go through some of the other ones, I'm not going to go through these step by step. A lot of them get pretty complicated. The um, not really complicated, but more convoluted the further we go on. But the limb salvage inde index, they talk about you know the artery, the nerve, the bone, the skin, uh, muscular tenderness, the deep vein, and then how long they've had uh, warm ischemia. So, and you see that's really applied a lot easier in the uh, hospital setting. Predictive salvage index, you know, the same thing, you know, the, the artery, the bone, the muscle, and then interval up to, and they already mentioned the operating theater. So, again, this is more, um, you know, limb amputation after the fact, after they've been in the hospital. The NISSSA scale. You know, this, you're talking about grading of the soft tissue injuries, you're talking about the different types of fractures, things that you really can't see um, that well on scene unless you have an injury that is so large that you're able to see the, you know, fractured bone, you know, coming through in the, ma the mangled part of the extremity. But to me, when you're at that point, when you're on scene, you're already leaning more towards an amputation than not anyway. So I, I just don't see the utility in these that, that much in a pre-hospital setting. And then, oops, sorry about that. There you go. And then the Hanover Fracture Scale, again, very um, complex. And, you know, you're talking about bacteriological smears and ischemia and compartment syndrome and things that we're just not going to be measuring on scene. So we talk about doing a failed amputation. Um, you know, one of the things that were discussed in a lot of different papers I read was what is the ideal equipment bag? And I think that everyone's going to have a different list of ideal equipment that they have and a different list of, of what they're actually keeping on their response vehicles or on their persons and able to perform a field amputation. Uh, the, I put together a list of the stuff that would just seem to be common throughout all the different um, equipment lists that I found. Number one, obviously, is PPE. You know, you need a mask, you need gloves, you need something to protect yourself from um, the bodily fluids and everything else that comes in with, with doing a field amputation. Um, the next thing that everybody needs is some way to, to do the amputation. So whether that's a Geely saw or an electric bone saw versus some of the talks that we've been having, I actually just had a pretty decent conversation with the rescue crew here in Syracuse yesterday was, you know, what do they have on their trucks if we needed to do a field amputation and either couldn't access with the Julie saw in a circumferential nature, didn't have an electric bone saw, you know, what, what do they have on their trucks? Well, you know, they have reciprocating saws, sawzalls uh, with different um, fine tooth bits that can do bimetal and maybe it might be useful for bones. They have the hydraulic cutters, you know, they have the jaws of life, but there was one paper that was put out that said that, yes, the jaws of life is probably one of the fastest ways to be able to do it. It took, on average, two cuts to be able to go through the bone, but the issue was that, with that was that the proximal bone that was left behind was extremely comminuted. Um, you're basically um, crushing and, and splintering the bone as you use the hydraulic cutter. So when we talked to the rescue, some of the stuff that they saw was, that they saw would be useful on their truck was really the Sawzall, um, being able to have little little kickback and being able to reach these people who are in awkward positions that are leading to them needing to be amputated anyway. Obviously on our truck we have the uh, Julie saw that we keep with us, but as we saw when we just did some uh, cadaver amputations training in the lab, Dr. Knudsen and I, um, the ends of those tended to break off rather frequently, so we ended up using having used some gauze to wrap it to prevent ourselves from being cut by the um, wires on the end while we were doing amputations. And these were in people that, you know, weren't in austere environments and weren't entrapped in things. These were cadavers laying on, on tables. Um, other thing you need, obviously, is a scalpel. I say scalpels with an S because if you have dulling of the blade, I think it's important to have multiple scalpels on scene. Some sort of bleeding control agent, you know, the tourniquet is the big one, being able to tourniquet proximally to where you were. Having things such as hemostats clamps to be able to um, stop any 
um, arterial bleeding or you know that you may have after the amputation or during the amputation and then whether it's Israeli bandage or some uh, hemostatic agents you know quick clot gauze or whatever you guys decide that you have in your bag to be able to control any massive bleeding that may happen after. Uh, for sedation people are using different things for sedations a lot of people are using a, either a morphine or fentanyl um, opiate and then a benzo on top of that um, we've been a we or I have been a fan of uh, ketamine lately. And then, you know, do you carry RSI drugs? Do you RSI these patients? Can they be safely reached for intubation? Are they in an area where you can safely control their airway? Um, if you can't control their airway, you know, do you want to be giving them opioids and benzos and taking away their um, airway reflexes? Or do you want to stick more with the ketamine and try to keep their airway reflexes intact and keep that airway dry for them? some other considerations you know for field amputation this problem with informed versus implied consent you know if you have a patient who's on scene and they're unconscious and they're entrapped is there an implied consent that they would want their limb amputated if it means that they would be able to live through the incident versus um, dying with their limb intact i think that that's a interesting concept because you know we, we use implied consent in the emergency department in in the pre-hospital field all the time you know these people who are too sick to consent or there's you know their intervention is is um, time critical but i think that some people's feelings are that amputation may be sort of on a whole different level you know you're literally taking away a part of someone's body so is there an issue with implied consent there and then also informed consent you know if you come on a scene and a patient is awake and alert and oriented and you're going to medicate them you know do you get informed consent from them that hey if we can't get you you know do you consent to this or is there family member consent should you take the time to try to get in touch with a family member if a family members on scene you know do you get consent from them before doing a, a field amputation other considerations you know here in our EMS vehicle we're obviously not carrying blood products with us you know there's a lot of other systems have these protocols in place where you actually have a, a team that responds from the hospital, you know, a trauma surgeon, a trauma resident, things like that are flown out to the scene and they come out with blood products with them and are able to administer blood products in the field. Uh, and then antibiotics and tetanus, the same thing. We're not giving, you know, um, pre-hospital antibiotics when we're doing these field amputations, which may become a problem when you're in a situation where you're rural and have extremely prolonged transport times. Is that something to think about? Should we, you know, have antibiotics available or is this even a consideration or can it just wait until they get to the hospital? Uh, another one is, you know, having protocols in place for treatment for crush injury. And obviously, they have some sort of crush injury. If you're not amputating a limb and you release the, the crush and pressure and they um, become ill for that. And then salvage and recovery of a limb for possible skin graft use. You know, do you continue the extrication after the, or do you continue the extrication efforts after the limb amputation to be able to bring the amputated limb to the hospital for possible skin graft or, or other uses? And notice I'm not talking about for being, um, for re-implanting at the hospital. I'm talking about using the patient's own uh, skin for grafting and other necessary procedures, maybe not only skin grafting, but um, uh, tissue and, and um, artery vein grafting afterwards if they're viable. So some of the discussion topics that I wanted to bring up, hopefully we can get some interaction here at the end and you know have a good discussion since we have so many um, uh, people logged on that have probably differing opinions is, First, you know, my question was, how far have we really come from the Campanet et al. paper in 1996 when it comes to, to this topic? Is Has there been a shift from um, trauma surgeons to EMS to medics? Has there been a, a shift in, um, you know, the, what we use as reasonings for why we amputate? Has there been any real changes that are worthy of discussion? And then should amputation decisions be based on time of entrapment, vital signs, exhausted resources, limb appearing unsalvageable, all of the above, the legalities of these definitions, because I feel like they all have some ambiguity to them as to, you know, at what point do you say, okay, and pull the trigger and do the amputation. Uh, should these definitions and decisions be different for urban cases versus rural cases, you know, in the rural areas, if you're going to take off this limb, you know, and then on top of that, you have an hour and a half, um, transport time to a hospital that I think that brings in a whole different set of uh, difficulties and, and interesting complications that can happen with this procedure. You know, and should um, these be regionalized? Should they be scene specific? Some other discussion topics. Uh, you know, who should be performing these amputations? I touched on it a little bit. 
should this be only versus emergency physicians only versus EMS and emergency physicians or other physicians who have EMS um, certifications and pre-hospital experience. And then should there be a development of a national versus a regional versus system specific protocol? Should this be something that's at the national level for these big disasters or should it be that each, you know, fire department, medical director, um, region has their, their own protocol in place for when not only when to activate the system but who's actually going to respond to these calls and what resources are available? And then the final discussion topic um, that interested me reading this last paper in 2012 was the concept of dismemberment of deceased to access the living. Uh, there have been a couple instances where there's been um, cases of dismemberment of deceased. You have a living person who's in a, a void in a collapsed building, but you have a deceased person um, who's in the way of getting to that living person, and you feel like not being able to remove that body to get to the living is going to you know, cause the living uh, significant harm or death. So in the cases that I read about where this has happened, it's actually been uh, family members of the deceased were contacted to discuss the situation and then, you know, conversations were had with both the coroner and with uh, city health officials and various other bodies to determine whether or not this was something that was okay to perform. And in both cases, they did go ahead with the family's permission to um, dismember the deceased. One person had, I think, like their um, right lower kind of quarter taken off to access a living victim and then another one that I read was a upper extremity amputation. Um, and the reason that they did this was they felt that removing the body whole um, would cause um, structural instability so that the best thing for safety of the rescuers and safety of the living behind the deceased was to dismember the, that deceased being and, and be able to access the patient that way. I just thought that that was a really interesting concept that I actually hadn't thought much about um, while doing my research and learning about, you know, field amputations. And then Dr. Knudsen always puts, you know, personal pictures at the end of his, so he stole this off of my Facebook page and uh, decided to. This is my wedding and my dog in his tuxedo. So we'll open it up now. I think Dr. Knudsen is going to be the moderator for uh, questions and discussion, but I'd love to hear what, you know, anybody asks. Anybody asks. Yeah. Chris, you're uh, muted yourself, buddy. That helps. All right, I've unmuted everyone else except for Derek, who's in the ER. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and speak up. I think our group is small enough we, we can handle that. Uh, I did have one question for Aaron. Um, the Giggly Saw is more of a handheld device, uh, which we've practiced on a couple of times. Uh, how easy do you find it to use to take off limbs and would you have used it on the bus uh, patient or bus case if it had come to that? Uh, that is what we had with us to be able to use on the bus case, but that also brought up the conversation on scene of what the rescue company had that we could use an alternative. You know, when we used it in the lab on the cadavers, once you actually got down through with the scalpel to the, to the bone, the procedure of taking the limb off itself with the um, uh, whether you call it giggly or geely or whatever you want to call it, saw. Um, the procedure itself was pretty easy, other than the wires at the end busting on the handles and us having to use the gauze to wrap around and protect ourselves from being stabbed by the wires. I would personally like to see, um, you know, the difference even in the cadaver lab of using the bone saw versus a just flat out reciprocating saw uh, versus using the the. <coughs> just because of the issues that we would have had on that scene with getting uh, circumferential access to that leg. That would have been the really big problem is being able to get that wire behind the leg to be able to, um, you know, do the, the amputation itself. Whereas if you had a reciprocating, you could come at it from any angle. Okay. Good. Are there any questions from the group or any comments? Aaron, it's Brian. Can you speak to where exactly, if you did have to do a field amputation on this patient, you would have cut compared to the length the patient ended up with, with the operative formal amputation in the hospital. So, oddly enough, like I said, I went, I went and saw the patient in the hospital afterwards, and where his amputation ended up was just as proximal as where we had would have had to do the amputation in the field. It would have ended up being almost exactly the same spot within a couple of inches. So, so it's likely they would have actually lost more length than right during the revision of your field amputation? Yes, yes. In the same place? 
I think that's true because I think that any you know anything that we do, they're going to need to be able to you know recede a little bit more to be able to get the skin and the grafting and do it a proper closure and be able to you know tie off the so-called loose ends that we would leave them. Um, but it, it still would have been probably within a couple of inches, but it would have been a very high field amputation, and he ended up having a very proximal hospital amputation. Good. Any other questions from the groups or comments? So I'm just kind of curious. So we have a we have a custom surgical kit from Centurion, right? So we use it in the upstate, and it, we tape the baby gauze to the outside of it. So you basically have everything you need. Do surgical airways, a modified uh, clamshell thoracotomy, uh, and uh, amputation, uh, just in one kit, and then the giggly saw. Um, if you watch the uh, University of Wisconsin uh, video, they use a hand hand uh, held wireless bone saw, and so that's so that's kind of interesting instead of the giggly saw. But I'm just curious, you know, basically, what is everybody else carrying? Are you, are you prepared for this? And if so, what do you? What's your approach? And how would you uh, how would you address this? And, you know. Derek, we had an opportunity to get a, a, a jiggly saw a couple years ago, but after using it in Dr. Daly's cadaver lab, line, is we really struggled to use it, and we didn't think it was a good tool. Um, our plan is to use a reciprocating saw off a rescue if we had to. Um, my, so I can comment on what we do here at Pitt. So my name is Jerry Escajeda. I'm the EMS fellow here at Pitt. Um, so we've actually encountered some challenges in getting the surgery folks on board. We try to elicit some advice from them and what they think would be best um, to carry on our uh, physician response vehicle. But um, so we, we don't have a dedicated surgical kit. Um, our plan has always been that if this occurred to just use the saw in, I believe it's a reciprocating saw that's on one of the uh, Pittsburgh paramedic rescue vehicles. Um, but we uh, really didn't have a surgical put together as of yet. And I would just make one comment. Um, yesterday I stopped by, for completely unrelated reasons, the rescue company here, and they happened to be doing some training with their tools. And I asked them, you know, what do you guys have in your truck? What do you think that we could use to do this? And their first response was the um, hydraulic cutters. And then I explained to them sort of the problems in the last paper with that. And then they went to the uh, saws on the reciprocating saw. And one of the comments from the rescue captain at that time was, hey, you know, uh, if this is a possibility and this is something that you want us to have on hand, you know, we'd like to have a discussion as far as what sort of blades you would like to have for this saw and what would be the best, what could we do to prepare to have, make sure that we have the proper equipment on our truck for you if it comes to this and you need to use our equipment. You know, obviously these saws have a lot of different blades with different um, teeth on them, you know. They had some very intelligent questions as far as, you know, here's what we have for the blades, here are the different indications for them. Obviously, none of the indications are human bone, but, um, you know, asking about, you know, what what they would need for us to be prepared. So I think that brings up a point of if you're planning on using your rescue company's equipment, having a conversation with them so they feel included in that decision-making process and be able to evaluate what they have on their truck and what we would be asking um, for from them in the event that you wanted to use their equipment. Or even, you know, I guess a simple solution to that too, Erin, it's kind of interesting you brought that up, but you know, maybe they, then if you know they have a reciprocating saw, maybe you, instead of taping a giggly saw to the outside of the tray, you tape your own reciprocating saw blade to the outside. So at least it's relatively clean rather than something they just use to cut through a car. And it's funny you should mention that. That was a conversation I was going to have with you the next time I sat with you. <laughs> we'll see about that. Although I have to admit the one field amputation I was involved with, we did in fact use a reciprocating saw, but that's because we didn't have what we would have wanted to have. So Jeremy Jasmine just said a link. Looks like he's got some. No, I'd like I'd like, I'd like to see if you guys you know could kind of follow, could have a follow up comment. But if you look at the University of Wisconsin uh, website, they, if you type into Google University of Wisconsin field amputation, you should be able to get their YouTube videos. They have two videos. This is obviously done by their surgeons, but I like but their. Uh, their soft tissue retraction with gauze is, is, is the way we decided we want to do it as well because it actually gets good purchase and exposes the bone a little bit better. But they have a 
you know, it's a bone saw. It's a, it's a pneumatic bone saw, or excuse me, it's a uh, electric bone saw, and it's wireless. So, you know, another option would be to say, well, you know, maybe we should carry our own reciprocating saw, but I, I would advocate that if we were going to spend money and carry a saw, a battery-powered saw, perhaps a bone saw would make sense. It can get into tighter spaces that even than the, bone, the uh, reciprocating saw because it cuts with a flat edge. Rather than having to get on top of the bone and cut down through it, it can cut from the front. So it's even, I can see the advantage there. The giggly wire, I'll just tell you that I've done this every year in the anatomy lab uh, for the fellow and we practiced uh, with the team members. And um, I don't seem to break a lot of wires, but the truth is if we're breaking wires, even in the anatomy lab, in, in anyone's hands, the likelihood of breaking them on the field when they're getting caught up in, you know, stuff under the dash and things is something to really consider, I suppose. Um, but that's how we always plan to do it. It's a cheap and easy way, but if it's, if we're finding that that might not be the best, um, it would be interesting to see what other solutions we come up with. I, I understand the reciprocating saw concept, and there is that paper that Aaron talked about that has the, uh, when you crush cadaver and bone with a, uh, with a hydraulic, it just splinters into bits. So it's not going to be a good limb salvage situation there. But yeah, just just clear, when we did the, the saws in the amputation um, cadaver lab, only one, it was only one, right, Knudsen? One actually broke in half. The other ones, the problem that we were having is where they're twisted at the end to go into the handles, the part that was twisted was coming undone. So we weren't able to get a good grip on it. So what we ended up doing is actually having to wrap it around the handles and then use some gauze to protect ourselves from poking wires. It wasn't that the one time it did split in half, but I also think I was going a little she, wrote, she hero on that one. But Well, it was, it was we used, uh, oh God, forceps or some sort of clamps to hold the wire in place then wrapped gauze around that. Right. We had the same problem last year with our last fellow um, of the wires breaking in the anatomy lab. Uh, I'd almost see us in the future if I did use the giggly saw, taking the handles off, using the clamps and gauze and just starting from there and not wait for it to break. The attachment is just so weak, it's not gonna hold uh, under the strain. So, and one other comment, um, there was, I forget the paper, um, we reviewed in Journal Club a couple years ago uh, with because Wisconsin or Minnesota had a field amputation, took off one leg uh, with a reciprocating saw, uh, took the patient out, went to the hospital, had both sides uh, revised, and it was the side taken off the field was fine, the side taken off in the hospital got infected. It's only an N of one, but uh, just kind of a curious factoid. Hey, if Mike Daly's still on. And Mike, would you talk about your amputation lab? I think it's been a number of years since anyone from here has been to it. Are you guys still using the Kigley saw or have you looked at other techniques? <coughs> My name's Adam. I'm one of uh, Mike Daly's residents. Mike had to step out for a little while. Earlier he mentioned to me that the wood blade on the reciprocating saw on the Sawzall was uh, one of the ones that they found best in the cadaver lab. <laughs> Okay, it's good to know. It's really interesting because talking to the, the rescue, they were saying that they they were worried that that might not be the best one. Openly admitting that they had no idea what bone would be like to saw through. But um, I mean, I'd be interested in our next cadaver lab coming up. Maybe maybe playing with some of those and seeing um, which one works the best for us. It's a good idea. Uh, we're coming up in about 50 minutes. Any other comments from the, the group or questions? Okay, good. So we'll wrap things up. Um, thank you, Aaron. That was fantastic, and I appreciate the group's input to uh, adding to this as well. That's what we're looking for and hope happens in the future. Uh, we are going to tentatively schedule the next conference for February 19th at noon. Uh, I may send out a doodle to the group to see if there's a better time for all of us. I know there's no way to get all of us together all the time at the same time. Uh, EMS just does not work that way. Uh, but we'll we'll ask the group is it a better time, and if not, we'll do it the 19th. Uh, topics can be discussed. We'll figure that out in the next week or so and then share it with all of you. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for joining us. Um, I think it went well. Uh, Zoom seemed to, to handle it, and... Uh, We'll come back next month. Thank you. I'm going to stop this. Here we go.